Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have five important papers in organic synthesis for the month of April 2023. The first paper for today involves diethanolamine boronates in this work from AstraZeneca. Some highlights of this paper include the development of a process for making a diethanolamine boronate, which was used to make this new API AZD5718. In this paper, they had to overcome a bunch of issues such as careful attention to reaction conditions, and they ultimately used this process to generate 2300 kilograms of AZD5718. AZD5718 is an active pharmaceutical ingredient, also known as an API, in clinical development for the treatment of CAD, also known as coronary artery disease, which is a widespread heart ailment affecting millions of people. CAD is triggered by the buildup of fatty deposits in cardiac arteries, which can lead to reduced blood flow, which can eventually evolve into more serious health issues. So in this first paper, they have this cool approach where they're able to add a THP group to protect their pyrazole ring. Now they get a mixture of both pyrazoles and unfortunately they weren't able to optimize above a four to one ratio. Now the neat thing here is they have this selective lithiation borylation chemistry, which enables compound two to be borylated, but not compound three. Now the issue here is both of these are liquids and what they wanted to do is get a solid that they could crystallize out so that it would be pure and free from compound three before moving forward in their scheme. So this was an issue because the B-pin compound wasn't a solid or if it was a solid, they were struggling to get crystals of it and they needed to come up with an alternative which they could crystallize. At AstraZeneca, they'd had some previous experience with these ethanolamine groups and they normally could take their B-pin containing compounds and mix them with diethanolamine and this would generate this diethanolamine boronate. Now, when they tried this with their pyrazole containing pinnacle, this didn't actually work very well and they got an equilibrium, so they couldn't crystallize out their product. In the absence of pinnacle, they were able to get diethanolamine to form the desired product in equilibrium and eventually crystallize the product out. Another one of the issues here was that this compound wasn't super duper stable and they had to explore a bunch of different conditions in order to purify compound nine. So since they needed to purify compound nine, they screened a bunch of different conditions that would eventually get it to crystallize. If you want to hear the whole story about how they did that, they eventually identified conditions that would facilitate the crystallization. And there's a lot of technical details in that. It probably won't be super relevant to your projects, but if you'd like to hear the whole story, I'd encourage you to check out the full paper. So eventually they were able to do all of these steps in one pot and selectively crystallize out compound nine. It turned out for them that almost everything affected the solubility of compound nine. So it was really challenging for them to optimize this whole process. Fortunately, they identified suitable conditions to optimize their yields and they ended up getting this to work relatively well. They also changed some parameters such as switching toluene to methyl THF that improved their yield and they eventually were able to get an 85% weight per weight yield of their product. This slide here just shows that when they did the lithiation reaction at a low temperature and low dilution of methyl THF, they got their highest yields. But if they let the lithiation run for longer, it favored higher temperatures as well as relatively high concentrations, low amounts of methyl THF. Once they'd identified a suitable route to prepare compound nine on scale, they were able to use this and finally prepared 2300 kilograms of their API, AZD5718. So this is the way that the authors make AZD5718, but I wonder if there's other ways that they could make this that we haven't thought of yet. Maybe we could do this using today's sponsor, Reaxis. So we're currently on Reaxis. Now that we've built this molecule, why don't we search up its structure and see if we can come up with a new synthesis. So here's a list of molecules that match our search. By clicking on the synthesis plan tool, we can create a retrosynthesis plan for how we're gonna make this molecule. This is just gonna give us ideas that we might wanna to apply to our synthesis, although we might vary the final concept from the stuff that Reaxis proposes. You can also choose other parameters, such as only choosing building blocks from a tier one supplier. You can decide how many different routes you want Reaxis to come up with, you can also play with the diversity of the proposed predictions. There's several different commercial building block libraries available to choose in Reaxis. This is a great option because you can constrain the output of the program to the library building blocks that you actually have. So now that we have our plans building, it's gonna take a couple minutes for it to finish its prediction. Once it's finished, we can take a look at what Reaxis suggests. So here we have eight predicted routes. Why don't we click on view and check it out? These actually look fairly similar to the ones that we saw in the OPRD paper, relatively similar routes, and that's because it's getting inspired by previous reports. As this is a known compound, there's published routes reported. In blue, we have the published route based on cited papers, and in the green, we have the predicted routes. You can also change the processing time if you need it to be faster than usual, or if you want to give it more time making a prediction. And some of the predicted routes that it proposes are quite similar to the published routes in this case. 
If you had different commercial building blocks available or different libraries available, you could specify different synthetic routes that you want Reaccess to take. So while this is currently showing routes that are available and similar to the literature route, that's just because of the constraints we had initially. So while these routes might not be the ones that get used for a final API, they might be really helpful for helping discover new routes early on and just give you new creative synthetic ideas that might help you conduct your research. Research is an inherently creative process and Reaccess makes it possible for scientists to create their new papers. I want to thank Reaccess for their support of this channel. The second paper for today involves the synthesis of cell phones via sulfonyl fluorides. Some highlights of this paper include the generation of aryl alkyl cell phones from sulfonyl fluorides. This paper also demonstrates photochemical SF activation using Haunch ester as the reductant. In this paper, they also use alkenes as radical acceptors, and a thiophenol was employed as the hydrogen atom transfer catalyst. This is a pretty cool paper. I was excited to see sulfonyl fluorides act this way, and why don't we talk about the proposed mechanism? The proposed mechanism of this reaction is as follows. Initially, the thiophenol is deprotonated by a base. The authors then propose that light is able to excite this thiophenolate to an excited state, and this excited state is then able to do an energy transfer, reducing sulfonyl fluoride, reducing benzene sulfonyl fluoride to the corresponding sulfonyl radical, as well as this sulfur-containing radical, and presumably fluoride. Once this sulfonyl radical is generated, it's able to react with this alkene in the less substituted position, generating a radical in the alpha position. This carbon-centered radical is then able to be trapped by a hydrogen atom, presumably from this Haunch ester, which is then able to give off a proton and be oxidized to the corresponding pyridine. Haunch esters are pretty cool, they kind of mimic NADH in the body, and it was really impressive to see the authors prepare this in this fashion. I wouldn't have ever thought of a sulfonyl fluoride as a radical sulfonyl donor, so this was really interesting to me. Some highlights of the scope are shown here. The authors demonstrated that this chemistry was applicable on a wide range of substrates, and I look forward to seeing if this chemistry gets used by any other groups in the near future. I thought that this chemistry was pretty cool, and if you like sulfonyl chemistry, make sure you give the full paper a read. The third paper for today is the deoxygenation of alcohols. Normally alcohols can be reduced under various different conditions, and in this paper the authors decided to use benzoates as leaving groups. So alcohols were first converted into benzoates and then subsequently reducted under photocatalytic conditions to afford the reduced product. In this case formate was used as the reductant in the form of zinc formate. They also used a thiol as a hydrogen atom transfer catalyst. This sort of deoxygenation reaction is pretty important in research as we often have oxygen groups that we want to get rid of. So let's say you do a Grignard reaction, you add a nucleophile to a carbonyl, you still have that carbonyl left over in the form of an alcohol. If you wanted to have a hydrogen there instead of an alcohol, there's various different conditions, such as barton mccombie deoxygenation and several other iterations of similar ideas. So in this case, instead of doing barton mccombie deoxygenation, the authors decided to generate a new method for doing this with formate under photochemical conditions. The proposed mechanism is as follows. Initially, they have formate in the form of zinc formate. The authors propose two different mechanisms, which both ultimately result in the formation of a formate radical anion. Try saying form formate five times fast. Once this formate radical anion has been generated, this is able to convert the benzoate into the corresponding radical, and this radical can then react with the hydrogen atom transfer catalyst to generate the hydrogen trapped product. This generates a sulfur containing radical, which can then abstract another hydrogen atom from formate closing the cycle and continuing the reaction. So the scope of this chemistry was quite good. Here are some examples of the various different benzoates that the authors were able to convert to the corresponding reduced product. I was happy to see that this isn't limited to activated positions such as benzylic and allylic as we often see in the literature. In this case, we see quite a wide range of alcohols that were successfully converted into their reduced analog. This includes highly useful examples such as compound 21, where we can see the sugars reduced to its fully reduced form, as well as these various functional groups and heterocycles that I'm just totally going to gloss over because of how impressive this chemistry is. They also demonstrate that this could be applied to some more complex examples, such as in the case of 27, where this is an intermediate for an antibacterial compound, and in the case of 29, where TMS-CF3, also known as Rupert Prakash reagent, was added to a carbonyl to produce the corresponding trifluoromethylated tertiary alcohol. This tertiary alcohol was treated with benzyl chloride in the presence of triethylamine and DMAP, affording the corresponding benzoate ester. Once this benzoate ester was formed, they exposed their compound to their developed method, and they were able to successfully undergo deoxygenation to afford compound 29. This is quite a useful one in my opinion. I am a fluorine chemist by training after all, 
And these types of reductions are ones that I've seen people I know try and do and fail at. So I think this is pretty useful chemistry. Let me know if you've had this issue yourself in the comments. I'd love to hear any of your reduction stories, and maybe a couple of us could help each other out in the comments if any of us have problems that we're stuck on. I also wanted to quickly highlight the creative use of Kessel lamps here. Here we have a reaction run in a graduated cylinder with four Kessel lamps. Uh, this is legendary, and I was very much amused to see this, so I'd like to congratulate the authors for their ingenuity. And hey, not only is this ingenious, they also did this on an 8.9 gram scale. So this is really applicable chemistry, and I'm excited to see this chemistry get used more in the future. The fourth paper for today is Room Temp Aryl Bromide Amination Using Copper. Some highlights of this paper include copper-mediated room temperature amination of aryl bromides and the development of a new class of anionic ligands for CN coupling, especially mediated by copper. I'm not an inorganic chemist, so this paper for me is one more or less of utility. The proposed mechanism here is about what you'd expect an inorganic chemistry proposed mechanism would look like in an organic chemistry paper. Initially, we have an aryl halide that undergoes an oxidative addition to their copper center. Once this has undergone oxidative addition, an amine is able to add to the metal center Upon treatment with a base, this complex is able to form an amide ligand which can then undergo reductive elimination affording the amine product. Now while there are other methods of doing this type of reaction in the literature, the majority of these methods are unable to effectively couple acyclic secondary amines and they rely on somewhat forcing conditions such as the use of palladium. Oftentimes people want to avoid palladium in synthesis because palladium is a heavy metal, it could be toxic if it's at higher levels still, so moving to copper was an idea that the authors were interested in exploring. Some examples of the scope are shown here, where both primary and secondary amines were able to effectively be converted to the corresponding aniline products. You can also see that the electronics of the ring varies quite a bit. We have some heterocycles here, and boy do we ever have heterocycles on this next slide. We have all sorts of heterocycles here, and various different primary and secondary amines. I just want to reiterate here that this reaction is done in DMSO at room temp, and they're getting insanely high conversions for these reactions. So if you need to do an aryl amination, maybe you'll want to check out this new class of anionic ligands for your very own chemistry. I thought that this chemistry was really cool. I personally don't understand any of the inorganic chemistry of it, but that's the great thing about being an organic chemist. You don't have to understand the inorganic chemistry. Now, despite that, I can guarantee if you do understand the chemistry, you can make way better educated guesses about what's happening. The fifth paper for today is the desymmetrization of boronates. In this paper, the authors demonstrated an antioselective desymmetrization of cyclic bis boronates. This reaction was palladium mediated and it utilized aryl bromides. Here you can see they have two B pin groups and because of their choice of ligand, they were able to selectively functionalize just one of these positions, giving an antio enriched products. The mechanism of this reaction is quite similar to the one we just talked about. We have a metal, we then have the oxidative addition of an aryl halide. We're then able to add this bis boronate which is activated by an alkoxide here. The palladium can then insert into the carbon boron bond, and because of the geometry of this bis boronate complex, it's able to selectively only replace one of them, and the ligand helped bias reactivity to afford one enantiomer over the other. Now one of the issues that the authors were running into is that they could undergo beta hydride elimination to form this allyl boronate product. So the authors had to get around this. I just briefly included this here to show that depending on the conditions, the authors could favor product 8 where you can see it's gone through this beta hydride elimination first, and then palladium's reacted in the three position. I just wanted to include this because there's a chance that one of you might want to do this chemistry and you might actually want to have selectivity for eight favored. So hopefully that's useful to at least one of you out there. Now in terms of the scope, this paper worked quite well. They demonstrated not only cycloalkanes, but also heterocyclic compounds such as protected pyrrolidines. And I would encourage you to check out the paper if you want to see even more examples. The enantiomeric ratio for these is fairly good. Here you can see the structure of the ligand that they're using. So I thought that this paper was pretty cool. If you like these papers or have anything to say, make sure you leave a comment down below, and maybe we can have a bit of dialogue. We also have a lot of honorable mentions for this month. I don't often say this, but the honorable mentions are all really good papers. I just don't have time to talk about every interesting paper that comes out in the literature. So if you need something to read, these are all excellent reads, especially the one from Mayer's group. And if you haven't ever read anything from Mayer before and you don't know what nucleophilicity parameters are, please, please look at Mayer's website and I'll include a link to that in the video description. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Thanks for watching and I hope you have a great day.